take a verbal roll call of all of our commissioners. Commissioner Hemmer, are you here? Here. Commissioner Bergeron, are you here? Here. Commissioner Weiner, are you here? Here. Good morning, fellow commissioners. Um, in just a moment, we're gonna have call-in time, public comment time. Um, it'll be coming up shortly for all agenda items and will be taken at the same time. Members of the public wishing to speak on matters posted for public comment time may call the following phone number, 629-255-1939. Again, that number is 629-255-1939. And we'll circle back in just a moment to see if we have anyone on the line. But before we do, we need to address that this is a virtual meeting. So I move that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Hemmer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. Commissioner Weiner. Aye. And I, uh, Aaron, am uh, I as well. All right, with that, we can officially call the meeting to order. Um, I'm gonna read our legal notice for everyone. As information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. All right, so the minutes have been circulated to the board. Um, thank you, Christy. Um, if everyone's had a chance to look over, the, over these, let me know if there is a motion to approve. This is Commissioner Weiner. Motion to approve the minutes is written. Second for Commissioner Hammer. Excellent. Let's do a roll call vote then. Uh, Commissioner Hammer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. Commissioner Weiner? Aye. And I am also an aye. All right, great. Now we're at public comment time. So I'm going to read that phone number again in case anyone missed it at the top of the meeting. If you'd like to make a comment, please call us at 629-255-1939. So now we'll officially open the floor for public comment. Christy, do we have anyone on the line? Commissioner McAnally, we do not have any callers. Okay, great. Let's give it um, just a minute to make sure we don't miss anybody. We'll have that lovely, awkward silence for a moment. Christy, just double checking, no one's joined. Still no call. Okay, great. We're gonna um, close public comment, but I wanna uh, also mention that if for some reason you missed public comment that our email inboxes are always open. So please um, reach out to the board if you have any uh, comments that you missed in this meeting. Next up, we have the financial report from Satrice. Satrice, you can take it away. Good morning, everyone. 
Good morning. The information, good morning. The information presented today is preliminary and all revenue and expenses for December 2020 may not have been recorded to the ledgers as of January 8, 2021, when this report was created. So the preliminary actuals through December 2020 are as follows. Revenue through December is $96,464. Expenditures are $1,031,191. Resulting in a net loss of $934,727. Depreciation expense is a positive $732,207. This is different than what we typically see. And the reason is, according to finance, New, depre new depreciation amount needs to be calculated based on the completed construction projects in FY20. In order to do so, a reversing entry was completed to capture said depreciation in the appropriate fiscal year, which generated a credit in FY21, hence the positive depreciation listed here. However, this credit will be offset retroactively in October 2020, and new depreciation amounts will be charged in the following month. So the total net loss adjusted for depreciation is $202,520. At the next board meeting, everything should be adjusted, and the depreciation expense should reflect the new depreciation amount. Next, we have our expenditures. Our top three expenses are payroll, utilities, and insurance slash low cap. Payroll expense is approximately $520,140, which is 50% of our total expenses. Utilities is about 195,300, which is 19%. Insurance permits and low cap expense is around 195,100, which is 19% of our total expenses. Lastly, I spoke with our contact in finance and was informed that last fiscal year's books have closed. However, the information um, will not be released until sometime this week. I was hoping that the information would be released before our board meeting. Um, so that I could supply the board members with the information, but that wasn't the case. I will uh, continue to follow up with the board, and not the board, I'm sorry, follow up with finance. And once the financial information is released, released, I will forward it to the board. This concludes the financial report. Are there any questions? Any questions from the board? Patrice, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now move on to executive director's report. Laura? Thank you, it's Laura Womack. Um, just a reminder, um, as we go through the meeting, since we do have a lot of agenda items, which I anticipate to uh, draw conversation, is to make sure you identify yourself prior to speaking. Um, I am going to actually reserve my comments because the majority of, of what I've been working on over the last month is reflected in the, in the agenda itself. Um, so you'll be updated as we go through the agenda um, on those agenda items. Laura, well, I have a quick question for you um, in the executive director's report. So we've had a vacancy on our board since uh, the summer, um, early summer. Um, and I'm just curious if you've heard anything from the administration about the filling of that seat. I think we are about to embark on a lot of big projects and it would be really helpful to have someone with us and onboarded um, so that we have a full board when we really get going on these projects. Um, I have not uh, yet. Um, but I certainly will follow up with mayor's office and their appointed staff that works on boards and commissions and see where they are on that. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for Laura? All 
All right, great. We will move on then to old business and start with Fairgrounds Improvement Update. We have seen Mr. Henley and Mr. Gobble here. I'll let you all take it away. Yes, good morning, happy new year, um, board, uh, and as well as council and staff. Um, I'll be starting this morning. This is Edward Henley, uh, Pillars Development. I'll be speaking on behalf of the project management team, which is led by GHP. Um, and I'll go first, and I will be turning it over um, to Ron following my presentation and any covering any questions that may that may be asked. Um, just just for for those who <clears throat> are, are on the board, you should have um, two dashboards for your review. Respectfully, one for fairgrounds improvement projects and the other for the fair park project. Um, if you have those in color, I'll be starting with the blue one um, for reference. There, there's not been any changes in, in format for these, but I will be um, highlighting a few things uh, around some changes in line items just as we move forward through the completion of some projects um, and, and work through, towards the closeout of the year. So I'll start by highlighting the fact that there is um, just over $2.6 million remaining um, from the funds allocated to fairgrounds uh, improvement projects. And in the first section um, related to the Expo Center, um, again, that remains at 99% complete. And as we've been for a while, a few things that are still working to be completed. But the one thing that you'll notice, and this will be echoed throughout the presentation, um, is that the construction line item has been uh, zeroed out in terms of cost to complete. That is because we are in the process of um, receiving the final bill from Skanska. And that final bill will be a zero dollar bill. So we were basically doing a full on reconciliation of their contract and we've tied things out. So that's that's great news. Um, so we'll be moving forward with closing that contract out. So you'll see in that first construction line item, um, 100% in terms of the percent complete, and that's that's why it's just reflecting that stage of the project. Um, there are still funds that are allocated for um, some design and engineering, very small, but that's just to make sure that we have um, a few dollars there in case we get any um, any cost that may have yet to be submitted, but that request has been made, um, and just any administrative cost to get a final billing together and go through reconciliation. ff and &E is a line item that um, from the original $500,000 allocation still has um, just over $92,000 left there. Um, myself, as, as well as Satrice, we spent some time going through um, and reconciling some costs, and so we feel very confident now that they're, that those spend to dates are, are represented well. Um, and again, there's still dollars um, for, I'm sure they're the extremely long list of things that Laura and her staff have um, in terms of ff &E needs. But um, to date, we're just, we're, we're happy to say that we've managed that budget well and there's still dollars remaining there. Uh, project management is another line item that is still open. Um, and just the tracking against the original um, budget outlay there so that's at 96% complete. Again, with, with that with that amount of funds left and where we are in the project, we feel that we're definitely in good shape um, and won't need to tap into other funds related to Expo dollar needs. So what you'll see um, now in the contingency line item is just, just under $193,000. That's essentially um, the net of closing out that construction line item as well as the reconciliation of costs above it. So um, as we move to close out that project, there's a there's a decent amount of funds that are still left there. And just for everyone's reference, the, um, the long-term goal has been to be able to return funds to Laura and her staff. And the area where we took a lot of funds from in the beginning to make sure we would make the budgetary um, constrictions that we had would meet those during construction, uh, we reduced the ff and &E line item pretty significantly. And so happy to report that there are funds there to bolster that now as we move to close out that project. The majority of funds that are remaining are allocated for the multi-purpose building. Um, and that project is planned to be kicked off here in the coming weeks. Uh, again, you will see that that's only 3%. <laughs> complete in terms of its overall pace. And that's, that's largely just because construction has not started yet. As we pick up there in a couple of months, 
uh, in the months ahead, that'll move fast and that project will be reported on um, on a monthly basis, just as we've done all other construction. But that'll likely be the area of um, primary focus, as well as the area where most expenses will move. The other line items there, um, the demolition of existing structures, I have reduced that down to a single um, line item. Uh, that process is completely uh, completed at this time. We closed out the contract with Renaissance, who was the demolition contractor for that project. As many of you will remember, the original allocation for that scope of work was $1.8 million. Um, the project itself um, only cost the fairgrounds in the city one, uh, just over $1 million, $1,040,459. And so that balance is shown there until it's um, allocated to other areas, but just wanted to keep that as a point of reference for the boards, uh, for the board to see as we've presented 1.8 in our entirety, just keeping that there. Um, and again, you know, that line item will likely move, but it'll be reported on and discussed in the future. The grandstands line item, um, there's been a little bit of movement there and, and largely that's that's because of the reconciliation effort that I talked about earlier with Satrice. Uh, we refined our, our cost there. Some, some items um, that, that I had categorized as um, grandstands were actually in FF&E. And so that, that movement just kind of balanced those out. And then there still is the open, still is the open uh, contract for HVAC updates that are taking place at the grandstands which represent those remaining funds uh, that, are, that are open and to be spent in the grandstands area. And then the very last line item in section there is the repairs, demolition, and site master plan that took place um, very early on before we started construction of the exposition building. And there's no movement there. And so still holding consistent at that 100%. And so in total of the 41 million that was allocated there again, um, just over 2.6 remaining for a total spend of 94% to date, and to date being at the close of the year, um, December 30th. I'll, I'll pause there if there are any questions about any of those line items. I know it's a lot of information considering the, the movement that has happened um, to close out the year and reconcile the finances. Hearing, hearing no questions, um, I will move to the Fair Park uh, dashboard, which a lot simpler, um, but you will hear the, the same theme echoed. Uh, the closeout of the Skanska contract has um, led to a zeroing out of the construction um, section in the dashboard. And essentially what you will notice is that the balance that was there has just flowed to the contingency line item. And so um, $218,000 um, that was kind of carried and floating in both the design as well as the construction area there has just flowed to project contingency um, with the same anticipation of, of to be allocated. Uh, as we close out the Skanska contract, there are still some um, warranty items and some um, replacements of, um, of plantings, but those are, 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 are warranty based. And so they, they don't have a cost associated with those in terms of the burden to be carried by the fairgrounds. And so again, that allowed for that to be zeroed out. So again, right now, um, overall allocation for that project, uh, reconciled our figures tie out. Again, the largest cost there was Skanska's um, work and that contract is being closed out. I'll pause at the end of, of that if there are any questions either from the previous dashboard review or the Fair Park um, dashboard. Okay, well, I, I'm still in the call. I'll, I'll be here, but I'll turn it over now to Ron. He'll be able to give an update um, as well as discuss um, infrastructure uh, related to the fairgrounds. Uh, thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, the infrastructure project, as everyone recalls, is a sports authority project. Uh, that project, the contractor is in the permitting phase uh, and in the coordination phase. We're getting set to start work in about a month. Uh, 
the obviously coordinating this project that's going to be the extension of Wedgwood, including a bridge going all the way to Craighead and extending Benton Avenue down by the Speedway um, is going to take a lot of coordination and with not only the MLS construction for the new stadium, but also with um, the fairground staff and how things can keep operational. Uh, but it's in that organizational phase and hopefully we'll be moving dirt here in about a month. Any questions on the infrastructure? Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. I'll be on any questions come up in the future. Thank you, Mr. Henley and Mr. Gobble. Next up, we have MLS stadium update. Today, we're going to hear from both Mrs. Kavara in regards to the stadium update and then from Mr. Dirk Melton with an update on mixed use. Mrs. Kavara, are you going to get started for us today? Yes, I will. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Dirk is going to be sharing his screen that we have a couple stadium shots to share with you. And while he's pulling that up, I'll go ahead and start. Um, uh, Mary, if I could interrupt you just for a second, um, would the administrator please allow me to have screen sharing privileges on the system? Thank you very much. Let me see if I can figure this out while, while Mary's presenting. Thank you. Okay. My name is Mary Kavara. I'm here today on behalf of Nashville Soccer Holdings. I will provide a brief update on stadium construction and our mixed use ground lease. And then I'll turn the presentation to Dirk Milton, who will provide a further update on the mixed use development. And Dirk, if you can move to the next slide. As you can see on this slide, stadium construction continues to progress. The bowl excavation is complete. Concrete is being poured for the back of the house structures. And uh, Dirk, if you can advance to the next slide. You can also see that they're beginning to pour concrete for the lower bowl seating. Uh, the next major milestone will be the steel work. We expect large cranes to be on site by mid month. And then the steel erection will begin near month end and targeting that the canopy for the stadium should be uh, up around uh, probably May or June of this year. We're also pleased to report that our DBE participation continues to exceed the 30% target and is currently trending in the 35 to 37% range. Uh, Mortens and Messer also set an internal goal related to women and minority labor hours of 20% and pleased to report that to date, those hours are also um, ahead of their goal and the site safety record is strong. We'll continue to provide virtual quarterly update meetings for the neighborhood with the next meeting being in March. And this is in addition to the weekly construction updates that are sent every Friday. The project continues to remain on track, so on schedule and on budget. And I'll pause here to see if there's any questions on the stadium construction project. Okay, if none, I also want to briefly update you on the status of the mixed use ground lease. We have commenced the lease and we are paying the full rent amount of $200,000, even though we do not have full access to all three parcels. We're excited to get to this stage. And I will now turn the presentation over to Dirk Melton with Market Street, who will provide a further update on mixed use. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary, and good morning, everyone. Uh, very nice to be with you this morning uh, virtually to uh, provide an update on the mixed use development at the, the Fairgrounds campus. Uh, our team has been working incredibly hard to get us to this point over the past several months to uh, really season uh, the first project on the campus, uh, and we're excited to be able to share some of that information with you with you today. Um, uh, this is an orientation uh, map for the neighborhood. Um, certainly, the the stadium uh, is well underway, as Mary had mentioned, and then uh, we are focusing on uh, preparing the first of the three mixed use development blocks uh, for construction starting this summer. Uh, this, the project that we'll be starting with is otherwise known as Block C. Uh, it is the uh, site that is most proximate to the stadium and the Speedway grandstands. 
Uh, we have reconfigured this site uh, per the request of the administration and other stakeholders uh, in the past uh, year, more or less, uh, to reconfigure it to fit more appropriately within the context of the campus. And we're very pleased with the way that this has uh, turned out in our design process. Um, the, the building overall uh, is coming together very well. Uh, it's uh, about the same size and shape as we had hoped uh, when we first conceptualized this project, uh, dating back to our initial work on this project and the community engagement process that we engaged in in 2017 and 2018. And so now it's time to, uh, to move the design uh, forward. Um, as Mary mentioned, the, uh, the stadium uh, construction is well underway. Uh, this uh, photograph is a few weeks old, but it also depicts uh, the view to the north toward downtown Nashville that um, calls out the approximate locations of blocks A to the north of the stadium, block B to the northeast of the stadium, and block C to the east of the stadium. That is the uh, topic of our, of our discussion today. Um, this is a conceptual rendering of the perspective project. It's rendered in monochrome because at this point in the design process, we have not yet identified materials or colors uh, for the exterior of the building that will come in the next design stage. Uh, this rendering depicts a festival atmosphere uh, as if there were an exciting event happening on the Fairgrounds campus, either at the uh, stadium or the Speedway or the Expo buildings uh, spilling out onto the street. Uh, and so the, the street that goes to the left where the uh, box truck is, is uh, the Benton Avenue extension. And the one that goes to the right between uh, the stadium and uh, our building is uh, the East Promenade. Uh, we've created, uh, along with the design and infrastructure team over the past several months, uh, room for a very generous and exciting uh, plaza, public open space in front of the building called Fair Plaza. And uh, that design is ongoing, and we know that that's going to be a very engaging opportunity for uh, fans and patrons and neighborhood members to come in and enjoy as we go into the project. Um, the project overall it features uh, about 20,000 square feet of ground floor uh, retail, restaurant, and shop space that faces Fair Plaza. And then that's topped by five stories of residential uh, use that's approximately 337 uh, units um, in the project. Uh, at the top of this rendering, uh, we have a new feature that we've added, uh, which is a uh, rooftop indoor outdoor space uh, for the residents of the building. Uh, this being a project at the top of the hill, uh, once you get above the tree line, there's really amazing panoramic views of downtown Nashville. And we think that's pretty exciting uh, for the residents overall. Um, these two uh, sections depict uh, the massing and the scale of the building in relationship to its surroundings. Uh, this is a section cut through the building in both directions, uh, as if um, you were looking uh, through the middle of the building. Uh, you would not see the courtyard, of course, uh, from outside the project, but this uh, section imagines as if, as if you could. Um, the stadium is depicted on the top left hand uh, rendering uh, separated from the building by the East Promenade. And then there's an access drive uh, that's being designed uh, between uh, the building and the Speedway grandstands that's on the right at the top rendering. Uh, the orange uh, space uh, in the uh, in the building is depicted as either commercial space or residential amenities. And then the tan uh, color is representing uh, residential units. On the bottom, this is a section cut the other way, north south, uh, where Benton Avenue is shown uh, in its extension on the left hand side. The gray massing to the left of that is a future project that will be built on block B. And then uh, to the right of the project, is a parking structure that supports the residential and commercial uses in uh, in the Block C project. Uh, these are uh, this is the ground floor um, uses that are engaging the ground plane at the uh, at the lo lowest level of the project. There are two uh, drawings because. The uh, site, as many of you are aware, has a significant topography. There's a one level difference from the east to the west that is being made up by the construction of this building. Uh, the entrance to this uh, stadium is approximately one level higher than the entrance to the speedway. And so as a result, we have a two step um, ground floor plane. Uh, the drawing on the left depicts the level that's e even with the stadium. And it has uh, some limited commercial space, as well as uh, the leasing center, the club room and the fitness center and the exterior courtyard uh, with a pool deck. Uh, for the residences, as well as a handful of residential units that are on the ground floor facing uh, the stadium and facing uh, the parking garage. On the right uh, is a drawing that depicts 
uh, what faces the speedway. And uh, that contains the balance of the commercial space facing Fair Plaza to the north, and then additional commercial space um, that engages uh, the area between the building and the stadium, uh, speedway rather, uh, that uh, that is, is featured there. Uh, our initial designs had ground floor residential units uh, facing uh, the, the grandstands for the speedway. This new design contemplates commercial space, and we think that that is a more appropriate and engaging use for uh, events that would happen uh, between those those two uses. Uh, this level also features some secondary amenity spaces, such as a mail and parcel room and uh, other uh, functions uh, that support the residential portion of the building. And then this drawing depicts uh, the uh, typical residential levels above, uh, levels two through six. Uh, the only difference between these, uh, all the units uh, stack very efficiently. Uh, the only difference is the left-hand drawing at the top left hand of the screen features the rooftop amenity space for the residents with the uh, downtown views, um, as we had mentioned before. And so um, in summary, uh, we're very excited to be where we are. The design and engineering team has done a tremendous job of bringing us to the spot. Uh, we continue to work with uh, all the stakeholders on the campus to uh, season this project and get it ready for permits. Uh, as I said, we would like to be under construction uh, the summer of this year and given the construction duration uh, this project would deliver in the fourth quarter of 2023 and then be leasing up uh, at the same time so uh, with that um, i'll pause i appreciate your time today and would we'll be happy to uh, entertain any questions you might have before we open it up for questions thank you so much mr melton and also thank you mrs cabara i want to uh, put a fine point on um uh appreciating the payment of the lease um from from you all because this is as everyone knows a particularly lean year due to the pandemic so thank you very much for that um do we have any questions from the board uh yes chairman uh McNally, this is uh commissioner hammer um <clears throat> mr melton thank you for your presentation i, I appreciate the, the transparency and the uh, update uh was curious uh, if you have uh started leasing uh any of the commercial spaces in earnest and if not when will that begin uh mr hammer we have not yet uh we are very eager to do that um however what you'll find uh with our other projects that we have in nashville uh, typically the the retail and uh, restaurant spaces usually don't get subscribed until we're about nine to 12 months away from delivery uh, that is uh, compatible with usually their opening plans uh, in a given market and then the then the construction build outs for those concepts take anywhere between six and nine months so our expectation is that um, the first uh, ground floor commercial concepts in this project would probably not deliver until uh, the middle of 2024. Okay. Uh, what about uh, your class a space yeah, the, the residential space, uh, you know, we will pro probably start pre-leasing that space 90 to 120 days before the building delivery. So that would be happening in the summer of 2023. And based on um, the market study that we have about our, um, our lease of absorption, we expect that the building would be full by the end of 2024. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there office class A space as well? Uh, yes, the, there is in the overall project. Uh, right now, our master plan depicts that on Block B, which is directly across Benton Avenue to the north of this project. And uh, no, no leasing has been done on that yet. Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Melton or Mrs. Kavara? Yes, Chair Whitman McAnally, this is Jason Bergeron. Um, Mr. Melton, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I wanted to try to just get a couple a couple more details out here. So the the um, Block C uh, building with residential, um, what do you have the the, the approximate quantity of of block of that Block C residential that will be workforce housing in, in number of units? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have uh, made, as a fact, as a matter of fact, yesterday, um, an application to the Health and Educational Facilities Board uh, in order to request low-income housing tax credits for the project. Uh, we made our THDA application for those tax credits uh, last night, as a matter of fact. 
um, with the goal of uh, creating um, additional uh, concentration of workforce and affordable housing, uh, even beyond that, which um, is required by the community uh, benefits agreement that we have um, on the project. So if we're successful in executing on that strategy, uh, approximately 160 of the 337 units that are currently designed in the project uh, will be below market rate, um, serving uh, residents that uh, earn uh, either 60 or 80 percent of median income. So we're, we're awfully hopeful that uh, that is successful and that we're able to make a very uh, meaningful contribution to uh, solving some of the affordable and workforce housing challenges in Nashville with this first project. Great. So that, that will all be included within Block C? Yes, absolutely. That's great. Okay, great. Um, um, regarding regarding the child care center that is provided for in the community benefits agreement, um, is that is that in Block A? Is that going to be in Block A or Block B? Yes, sir. Uh, our current designs show that uh, depicted in Block A. The reason for that is uh, is that we believe that that will be the next phase um, after this project is underway, and it is also. Uh, the most distant uh, from some of the uh, more active uses on the campus uh, in a quieter part of the neighborhood uh, that's up adjacent to uh, some, some uh, lower density housing. Uh, that's also an opportunity for us to incorporate uh, some green space into the project that allows a playground for children. And so that would be uh, on block A in a future phase. Okay, thanks. Um, I, think that's, I think that's all I have at the moment. Anybody else has questions? Thank you, Commissioner Bergeron. Commissioner Weiner, I just want to make sure you're you're good. I, I do have an additional question. Oh, uh, no, but but go ahead, Commissioner Bergeron. No, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think Commissioner Weiner was about to speak, and I didn't want to in, intrude there. I'll wait. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Mellon, just, just kind of clarifying, um, I, I'm not always the best with uh, spatial rendering, so I just want to uh, sort of look here. So the, the, the depiction we see actually on what you have on screen here, um, uh, this this uh, plaza is the, the the plaza. This is the this is the the infamous plaza that has been discussed uh, <laughs> very often through through media reports and and coverage and whatnot. Um, is that is that correct? Uh, that, that's right, uh, and uh, I will say that the design and infrastructure team has been uh, really working very hard to make this an amazing and activated space for the public. Uh, we're actually really excited about it. Um, I think it's additive to everything that we're trying to do, and uh, we're looking forward to, to moving along in its design process. Okay, thanks. If there are no more questions from the board, uh, thank you again, Mr. Melton and Mrs. Kavara. With those updates. We look forward to hearing more from you. Thanks for your time. All right, moving on to event updates. We have uh, Laura and I believe Mr. Wallace is on the call as well. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, needless to say, we are not actively um, hosting any events at the moment. Um, Scott Wallace is on the call. If he's got an update regarding anything that we are talking about for the future as things improve with the pandemic, um, certainly we look forward to resuming activities. Um, but our goal had, had been to hopefully have an outdoor flea market in April, and we will keep our fingers crossed that again, the pandemic is at a place where it makes sense to, to begin that process and, and start hosting those events again outdoors. So with that, I will turn it over to Scott and he can talk about any progress with any of the events he's currently talking with. Thanks, Laura, and good morning and happy new year to all. And just to reiterate, yes, as, uh, Laura, as Laura said, we're not doing any events this month. Uh, we are working on an event uh, for February because, as you know, we have to do everything outside due to the uh, pandemic and also with the um, with the uh, shelter that we that we're hosting at the in our indoor facility. So 
Uh, we do have an event that's going to be outside, of course, that, you know, weather permits, if weather permits. And I think that's the apprehensiveness of our uh, promoters to be able to go outside with, with weather issues. So I sent to you all our, what we were supposed to have uh, if we didn't, if we could have had events. Um, and then you know, if you look in yellow, those are the events that we are trying to have outside. We are, as Laura talked about the future, we are working on we're opening back up in June if possible. And uh, so we have, we're working diligently to make sure that those uh, uh, weekends are being filled up. We also have some exciting uh, things in the future that we're working on. One event I can't discuss because they, they asked that we didn't do it publicly. We're working on it. Um, if we can make that happen, it would be a, a huge event that uh, we would be able to have. Another event that we're working on is, uh, because it's going to be outside, a lot of we're working on getting some schools like Meharry that don't have an outside facility to do their graduation at the fairgrounds and um so that is that's exciting that we can pull that one off um and and i wanted to talk about the jingle beats event that we just had and i know a few of the commissioners went to it it was a success uh, we had you know just a few calls uh, that we that we anticipated because of the music but it was also cut short because of the christmas tragedy here in nashville but it was a success all in all they have already uh booked for uh, I hear this. They've already booked for um, 20, well, 2021, starting with the same dates. Uh, we are going to be working around some things uh, to make that happen again. Um, and just all in all, it's just been a challenge because of the, the having to do it outside. But we feel like, you know, we're, we're able to continue to do the work that we've been doing. Um, we back backloaded the, the schedule of the year uh, pretty much every uh, date is pretty much uh, booked. And so we're happy about that. Still trying to move events around. Uh, that's in the first part of the first part of the fiscal year. And so that the back in the fiscal year, excuse me, but we're gonna, we're, we're still working on that. We feel like we're gonna be able to, when we're able to open, to be able to open up and just go with it running. So we're excited about that. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here. Uh, appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Wallace, and thank you and the staff for <clears throat> continually playing chess on this. It's not easy to move dates for events, and um, we really appreciate all the work that you're putting in to make this year as successful as possible. Do we have any questions for Mr. Wallace from the board? Chairwoman McAnally, this is Jason Bergeron. Um, uh, just wanted to thank, thanks for all his continued hard work and um, uh, had a chance to go to Jingle Beat, and it was a nice, um, uh, nice escape in this really tough uh, holiday season for a lot of folks. Um, and I did want to note—I mean, obviously, uh, the way the nature of Jingle Beat being several, being multiple weeks, um, and and having a lot going on with it, um, had had sort of the potential um, to, to sort of be a bit of a, a bit of a grind on, on some of the surrounding area from time to time. But I did want to note that uh, I, got, I got some feedback that they were the folks who ran that event were extremely responsive. Um, I think there were some, some of the speakers on entrance before you even really got in while you were waiting in the line area, um, those sort of projected more towards the surrounding area. And um, my understanding was that they were very responsive in that regard when they received some feedback um, and, and, and were actively giving out their contact information to uh, some of the surrounding residents who live right there to try to uh, mitigate on that that component. But so I think there's some tweaks that we can also make that might uh, address that. Uh, I don't I don't know that you need real bass or music for folks who are just waiting in line um, to get in things like that. But they they seem to have been very um, very responsive and a, and a good neighbor um, in that regard. So, so credit to them and, and, and thanks, Scott, for, for the, the creative event under the circumstances. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, we that was one of the things that we're going to work on next year. I, I I told them I didn't understand how they would have the projection of the music outside and still have the radio station to be able to use it. I, I didn't understand that. <laughs> Could no one explain to me why they had to do both? I, I you know, Maybe it's my old age, but, I, I, you know, we're going to work on that. And, and as we get more and more we hope that we can make this happen um and we're, we're glad that you were able to attend and, and have a good time with that uh, but yeah we we are in total agreement with that sir thank you no, that was great 
Any other questions from the board? All right, thank you so much to Laura and Scott for that update. We'll move on now to new business and start off with the Speedway RFP. Laura? Thank you, it's Laura Walmack. Um, so we talked a little bit the last uh, board meeting about um, extending the contract with Track Enterprises for 2021, but looking beyond that into 2022, um, the because we are in the needing to procure those services um, for Speedway operation, we had discussed an RFP. So usually when we do an RFP, there is a board representative that is appointed to represent the board through that process. Um, so I just offer that up as a an option for the board's consideration if they would like to um, appoint someone, nominate and appoint someone to assist um, as we evaluate that process. Well, um, this is Commissioner Hammer. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the board's, uh, you know, re upcoming responsibilities, what we'll be looking for us to, you know, uh, provide uh, insights on? I know we'll, we'll be having to, uh, you know, maybe it's, a, it's an RFP, maybe it's just the direct contract negotiations and improving the, the contract, but it'd be helpful if you could give a, a high level overview of everything you, you expect us to, to, to need from us. So it, it really is at the pleasure of the board. So if you recall, when we RFP'd um, previously, there were two board members that assisted in the process. One as um, a representative that was involved in the RFP process itself, and then it transitioned to a second board member for negotiation of the resulting contract. So. It, 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 what I'm, I guess, looking for now is just that first part, is looking at, um, you know, what what the options are for procurement moving forward, um, certainly in light also of the next agenda items as, as we're going to discuss the Speedway, but um, that certainly is a, a point that we will need to evaluate amongst um you know, other topics associated with, with the RFP and, and the Speedway moving forward into 2022 and beyond. So I, what I would be looking for is someone, um, if the board is interested in appointing someone to just assist with the, and participate on the RFP team as we go through and evaluate that. Hey, Laura, this is Jason Bergeron. Um... Uh, I think one question I had posed um, uh, to you a, a couple weeks ago was was uh, was whether to, you know, I guess maybe it may be more of a question for Alex and Metro Legal. Um, um, can can one board member serve on both the RFP committee and and then work on negotiating the contract with the with the chosen uh, 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 vendor uh, promoter? This is uh, Alex Dickerson, Metro Legal. Um, yeah, I don't think that would be an issue so long as it's just limited to to one board member. Thanks. So, does anyone feel strongly about this? Does it? Would anyone like to step up for this? Potentially. Uh, I mean, you know, I, this is Jason Bergeron. I, I just wanted to voice that I, you know, having worked on these, um, I'm happy to continue to. I mean, at the very least, I'd like to work on the the actual contract negotiation with the cho chosen promoter if someone has a a strong desire um, to serve in the RFP function. But I, I, depending on how this further discussion goes, I, I do want to discuss the RFP a little bit. Um, but but I, I would like to at least serve, continue to serve as. Uh, sort of negotiating the ultimate the ultimate contract uh, based on the experience uh, 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 of, of you know the last three three contracts. Commissioner Weiner, sure. yes, this is Commissioner Weiner. Um, I'd be happy to serve in either capacity, given my history of being able to negotiate some of these ticky details and trying to bring people together and, and find good resolutions. 
Um, so you can throw my name in the hat as well. Okay. So Alex, I'm, I just want to uh, double check. Would would it be possible if we split those duties up to designate now that Commissioner Weiner be over the RFP process and Commissioner Bergeron be over the contract process? Yes. Okay. Well, then that seems like a potential compromise. I'll I'll make a motion that the board designate Commissioner Weiner to be in charge of the RFP process for, or be the board representative of the uh, RFP process for the Speedway and that Commissioner Bergeron be the appointed board member for negotiating that contract. Do I have a second? I am around second. Any discussion? This is Commissioner Bergeron. I do have a, just a bit of discussion on, on as I kind of uh, advertised, I would uh, on the on the RFP process. Um, uh, I've had a chance to talk with with Laura a little bit as she's been preparing those RFP documents. And um, one one item, um, and it, it's it's actually referenced uh, discussed in, in the memorandum I, I prepared that was that was submitted to the director and, and distributed to the board as well. Um, th that I, I do want to sort of highlight um, uh, as we go into the RFP um, is, and some feedback I've already provided to Laura in formulating the RFP is regarding track rentals. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I discussed sort of the history and the nature of track rentals at, at length in the memorandum, um, but uh, I really feel it's time that it's, it's time that the board address track rentals. And, and, and what those really are and what they mean for the surrounding community. Um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what they really are is, is, a, is a sort of lingering tradition that, that hasn't really gotten a lot of uh, sort of clear attention and it's been uh, addressed more recently incrementally. But, um, you know, I, I strongly feel it's time that the board, you know, in, in, in part of this, this RFP and the contract negotiation um, address and, 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 and bring track rentals down to, to being uh, uh, no longer a part of the, the promoter contract. Um, and that was some feedback I provided to Laura to, you know, not necessarily have the, the, the RFP submittals assume that there will be a track rental component. Um, you know, I, I identify some of the economics in those in, in, in the memorandum I drafted, but the, the, the fact of the matter is it is just, it's no longer feasible for um, the fair board to be collecting just $300 for um, what is effectively another race. You know, we, we've made a lot of progress and I'm glad we've set new baselines saying, okay, 25 is it for the year, but that's too much. You know, the, and the, the big thing I found as I talk to the communities again and again and again, is that people, people in the community think those are races. And that's why they have strong, such strong feelings because when the Formosos had the contract, they were doing 50 to 70 track rentals a year. And, 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 and we, had, we had to get that in line because these are rentals, these are testing. Uh, this is not racing, this is, this is testing. These are ancillary events. And, and, and we don't do that anywhere else in Metro. Uh, 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 my garage band, which it doesn't exist to be clear. Um, <laughs> cannot rent, cannot rent Ascend Amphitheater for three hundred dollars and go shred for four hours um, at everybody else's expense around there. And so I, I, I raise it now just because I, I implore uh, uh, the board to kind of to have a have a discussion about this. But I'm, I'm and I'm also if if Commissioner Weiner is serving on the RFP committee and reviewing that, uh, I, I strongly believe that the next promoter contract needs to end this practice absent some massive financial changes. And even then, what, what, what is the value? Um, you know, what is the appropriate value of revenue Metro could make from a track rental that justifies the disturbance? Well, I think it's in, it has to be enormously different. And I just don't think that that is feasible. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's on topic. It's a little, it's a little astray, but, but I, I'm happy that if sure, if, uh, Commissioner Weiner is, is serving in the RFP committee. I, I want this considered in, in ranking the, the bids because I certainly consider want to bring it to the table as uh, in negotiating the next promoter contract for 2022. And I, I appreciate the time to, to talk a little bit about that. 
Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. Chair, this is Commissioner. I do have a response to that. It's more in the form of a question and something that I'll be curious for Alex and the guys in legal to give me some insight on as we move forward. Um, my initial question is going to be um, in insofar as we heard that a ban on any kind of track rentals um, not related to racing would be of interest to the neighborhood. Um, is that consistent with the Metro Charter Amendment that was passed with regard to the fairgrounds? Um, I'll be curious to look at that um, insofar as, as how we move forward on that particular issue. Thank you. Okay, Do are we ready for a vote? We're in the middle of this motion. I'll do a roll call. Commissioner Hemmer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. Commissioner Wiener? Aye. And I am also an aye. Okay, great. Uh, that wraps up the RFP discussion. Moving on now to discussions with Speedway Motorsports. So this is a, a sort of formal introduction of this potential project. We're going to hear from... Mr. Bill Phillips in the mayor's office and Mr. Jerry Coldwell from SMI. Um, Mr. Phillips, would you like to take it away? Well, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, oh, almost a year ago, uh, we became aware of that Bristol, uh, uh, along with NASCAR, was interested in the Speedway and its future. Uh, it's got a great history uh, in the uh, in the racing uh, chronicles. And so we had a number of discussions over a longer period than any of us expected because of uh, the things we were dealing with during the year. But uh, late in the summer or early fall, we came to an agreement to formalize talks uh, through the fair board. Uh, and uh, Metro. We've been in contact with the state ECD. They have an interest in participating uh, in anything because they see it as a benefit to the region. Uh, and uh, so there's interest at the state level of being involved from an economic development standpoint, which would benefit uh, the, the project of becoming a reality. Um, we are at the stage now where, rightfully so, you will sit down uh, with representatives. Um, Mark Sturdivan uh, from the mayor's office will be involved as a representative here um, in, uh, over, in the development, just as he is in the um, exciting plans for that little section called HC and that uh, plaza that is really looking nice. Uh, so Mark has a long history in these types of projects and think he can bring a lot to the table. Uh, Bristol uh, has a long uh, history in the industry. They understand the industry and there is a, a desire on the part of uh, those in racing to see the track uh, revitalized. Uh, but uh, I know there is concern about the number of races and such, and that's been discussed, uh, that that's something that we have to come to a mutual agreement on. Also, Bristol uh, should be applauded for its emphasis on uh, working with the community, uh, just like uh, MLS has, on how to uh, make this something that adds to the city and serves the city, but doesn't disrupt the community uh, in an adverse way. Um, although we all recognize racing is racing. Um, but we're, we're excited about it. We think it's got possibilities. We look forward to the discussions uh, that will be uh, held over the coming weeks and months, I would imagine, uh, and the possibilities. Uh, one of the uh, things the mayor talked about repeatedly was that the goal is that the speedway would be successful enough that it would contribute uh, to the financial stability of 
the fairgrounds uh, and that it would also be a part of the larger fairgrounds and be a partner uh, in activities there and participating in the ways that it can in, in things other than racing itself. So uh, we think there's a lot of possibilities and uh, look forward to the coming discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Um, Mr. Caldwell? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, hope everyone's having a great day. Good to be here with you today virtually. Uh, Mr. Phillips, thank you. And uh, we really wanna thank the administration for uh, all of their hard work, uh, many conversations as Mr. Phillips referenced over this last uh, challenging 2020. Uh, and Laura, um, thank you for all of your, your hard work and um, the conversations we've had. And we look forward to more. We're very excited to be taking this step forward. And uh, as we've said repeatedly, we believe the sum is greater than the parts on that fairgrounds facility. And we, we are, um, very passionate about being a good neighbor and being a good partner with the city. We're looking forward to sitting down and hearing from the community, uh, the neighborhood, uh, the racing community, obviously the fair board members, uh, and being able to address any concerns and make sure that we create an environment that's a win for everyone. Uh, as, as Mr. Phillips referenced, we really want to be a good partner. We've demonstrated that. Um, across the country with our other facilities, whether it be Charlotte, Dallas, Fort Worth, Las Vegas, or newly into Austin, Texas. Uh, it's very important to us to be good, good community citizens and uh, make sure that we create an environment that, and a facility that everyone can be proud of. So we're looking forward to um, carrying these conversations on and um, the next steps. Great. Uh, Mr. Caldwell, can you talk a little bit about what you perceive to be the immediate next steps in, in terms of the board's involvement? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that quickly will be conversations. Uh, we want to um, begin conversations with each and hear concerns and be able to talk through um, our ideas on how we can make this a, a take this historic property um, that deserves to be um, a, a gem in not only the NASCAR community, but really the entertainment community. And um, we want to hear from the fair board members their concerns and make sure we can share our, our ideas and come to something that works for everyone. Great. Is that is that something that you think that we could accomplish before the next board meeting so we have a little bit more context? Yes, we... Uh, we would like to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with each of you. Um, and we think we can do that before the next board meeting and then be able to come back and share uh, share that information. That would be wonderful. I do, um, and, I, and I'm gonna open this up for other board members to, to speak as well, but I, I will say that from both the administration and from you all, because there are several uh, legislative possibilities or, or needs to, to move this forward and um, some uh, th things that are out of our uh, purview, it would be really helpful if we could get some sort of mock timelines because we have so many moving parts. Um, we're, we're playing chess ourselves with, with um, putting out RFPs for 2022 and, and all that, to, just to know what some potential timelines might be if the project is successful, um, I think would be very helpful to be able to look at before those meetings. Uh, okay. I, know, I know there's a lot of moving parts for you all as well, but just, you know, at least rough timelines would be helpful. We can do that. We'll work with the administration to put that together and then be able to review it um, in our conversations. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board for Mr. Caldwell and Mr. Phillips? I have one quick question. This is Commissioner Weiner. In so far as looking at the logistics of this whole process and layouts, um, and, and I'm going to kind of tag back to the original conversation that we had in looking at parcels A, B, and C. Um, do you envision or have you guys envisioned um, any changes to areas between C and the track in so far as this is um, proposed? 
Uh, this is Bill. Maybe I can um, uh, address the, uh, it a little bit and then see what uh, Mr. Caldwell has. But we have uh, been talking um, uh, very agreeably with uh, the soccer uh, and um, marketplace. And uh, we, we're in uh, Mark Sturdivant that I mentioned earlier has been our representative and it is coming together uh, in a great way. Um, and we have kept uh, the Speedway abreast of, you know, uh, of most of the um, information on that. Uh, and uh, we do, we, we think that we're headed in the right direction, that it will serve the entire fairgrounds of that plaza, as well as the entire community. We'd like to see the a time that people would go there and uh, maybe enjoy coffee if there's a coffee shop or something like that uh, and enjoy the plaza and the entire uh, the park area and tra uh, the trail, uh, walking trail that we see coming down around uh, near uh, the creek. Uh, and so uh, we think it's all coming together very nicely that it complement all the uses of the fairgrounds. So hope that helps. It does. This is Commissioner Weiner. Thank you so much. Commissioner McAnally, this is uh, uh, Commissioner Hammer. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Caldwell and uh, Mr. Phillips, for, for those remarks. Um, one thing I will echo from uh, uh, Chairman uh, McAnally's comments is, uh, yeah, I think it definitely would be helpful uh, to see a timeline and then uh, the, the details in those timelines associated with uh, what uh, you know? What uh, specific uh, gating items are, are needed? I know there's a lot of moving parts, but from our last discussions, I know there was some state legislation. There's obviously going to be some metro legislation as well as the, the items that uh, the, the the administration and the uh, the fair board will be responsible for. So, so seeing that out, out there, will, will, I think will be very helpful. Um, you know, one thing I uh, a comment I'll, I'll make is one thing I feel like we are is, a, is just a, you know, one leg of the stool, so, so to speak on this of understanding what uh, we should be doing uh, and when we should be doing it, uh, you know, in, in coordination with those other activities, I think will be be helpful for us. Um, and uh, we'll be interested to see this uh, proposal as the, uh, you know, the details uh, come out as they're, they're negotiated and et cetera. And um, I'll just say one thing, uh, uh, well, a few, a few things, uh, you know, I am very cognizant of the work uh, that's being ongoing uh, at, at the soccer uh, stadium and the commitment that the board uh, has, has made to, to see that out and, and want to make sure uh, that first and foremost, we're, we're, seeing through those commitments uh, as we, you know, work in coordination to, to uh, see how uh, racing fits into that that piece uh, on the fair as well. Uh, and then lastly, for uh, for Mr. Caldwell, as, as those details come out, I think one of the things that I'm particularly, you know, interested in is the, the business case uh, of this, uh, of the, the upgrades and, and the items that will be coming into that. I'm just you know, not as familiar with the, the racing business uh, as I, I should be. And so I'm, I'm going to be looking at that as we uh, get into the, the details of this uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hammer. Commissioner Bergeron, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, just, just briefly, I appreciate the introductory comments and um, uh, appreciate that there are a lot of timelines and, and touch points legislatively, um, I, I do want to caution, I think, that we need to be, I want to make sure we get this sort of right size in the right place so that we actually have a proposal. Um, you know, and my memorandum kind of highlights that. We need to understand the assumptions, and I look forward to having discussions with with SMI and the mayor's office to understand what, what this proposal really is. Um, and, and there has to be a point that, that this needs to go, I, I want to stress, to the community. Um, and because we just we just finished we just finished a, a process uh, that that needs to be matched or exceeded, which is that uh, there was an enormous uh, community uh, engagement process that took place for for the soccer stadium and um, uh, project and related projects. Um, several you know multiple on top of multiple public meetings, uh, the soccer. Uh, soccer canvassed throughout the community with their own, with additional meetings, 
Um, obviously, during the, with the pandemic, that is even more of a challenge, but that doesn't mean that those engagements don't have to happen. And, and, and that needs to happen on the front end. I just want to be clear, you know, uh, we, what we shouldn't be doing is we shouldn't be going to the legislature to pass sort of enabling legislation without clear, a clear 100% you know, idea of what the proposal is and without community feedback. I mean, I just want to make sure we're doing um, things in um, an appropriate order and uh, just again, as I highlighted in the memorandum, a big piece of that is there has to be a community benefits agreement. There absolutely has to be a community benefits agreement that matches um, um, and protects the provisions of the, the stand-up Nashville, Nashville soccer community benefits agreement to ensure that whatever uh, partnership we can hopefully find here doesn't undermine that, defeat that, um, but also brings independent community benefits that are tangible and real, not, not just economic benefit numbers that get thrown out from the air, um, that, that's not what we're talking about here. There have to be real community benefits. There has to be a community benefits agreement that at least protects the soccer community benefits agreement and does more. And I, I, I just want to stress that uh, uh, importance um, as we start these conversations and, and look forward to getting more details and digging in and trying to find um, a good solution here. Thank you for those comments, Mr. Bergeron. And, and yes, I, I would, the expectation would be that community benefits, uh, community discussions, all of those would be included in, in the timeline that we're going to look at upcoming. Um, thank you for putting a fine point on that. This is Commissioner Weiner. I just want to add to that, that any kind of um, legislation that would come from the state um, really doesn't bind us. It gives us um, the ability to have an umbrella under which we can be quite specific insofar as what our requirements are, um, the CBA um, and working with Stand Up Nashville in order to be consistent with what's already required on the property. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, thank you, Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. We look forward to speaking with you both uh, sometime in the next month. We'll move on to our final agenda item, uh, divisional fair. Laura. Thank you, it's Laura Womack. Um, it, we've talked a little bit about this. I'll just give a, just for background, um, especially for new callers or new listeners to the board meeting is the Tennessee State Fair and Exposition Commission had voted to um, pursue discussions with Wilson County to move the Tennessee State Fair for uh, the future and relocate the fair to Wilson County. Um, so that has certainly spurred us in action to uh, reevaluate what fair we want and see representing Middle Tennessee uh, as for a divisional fair on the property. Um, I think everyone is um, certainly cognizant of the changes that could occur in 2021 to a fair based on the pandemic, um, similar to last year when they went and did a fully virtual state fair. So where we are now is looking and putting together a proposal and kind of re we have an opportunity now to to really kind of start from scratch and see what kind of fair um, we want to have um, and some of the industry that we want to highlight here in our divisional fair um, I will say, give you just some examples of some high level uh, concepts that we are working through right now. One is um, wanting to be the best at maybe a few things instead of dabbling in a lot of things. Um, we've done a lot of, of discussions about the history of the fair and you know, one thing that was clear to me is our role in some of the smaller livestock breeds and our recognition back in the day of being the best. We had apparently the best goat show in the nation. And I think that is something that's very attractive to go back to, in my opinion, is to be um, really, really great 
at one thing or a couple things instead of again just um, doing too much and um, kind of striving to be uh, you know almost like a jack of all trades with an affair instead of really maybe taking a step back and concentrating more on one thing we've got a good history of of putting on some really great livestock shows and i think you know that could be a new future for us is looking at some of these small breeds and how we can again emerge as a leader in some of those small breed shows so that is kind of an example certainly looking at programming too there are you know traditional uh, arts and crafts that are really unique to our our fairs that we've seen at the fairgrounds certainly would want to continue that um, and there's always been in conversations with uh, current board members as well as, as former board members is how we can include some STEM concepts in the fair. Um, some of these certainly could involve active pro projects with the school board and try to get some more students involved locally on you know, incorporating and showcasing displaying STEM as it relates to things that we say we do at the fairgrounds, for instance, construction, um, racing. You know, there obviously is a lot of advancements in automotive industry today and how we can maybe showcase that specifically and tie in the speedway um, to some of the projects that our students are engaged in in the divisional fair. There's certainly a large educational component in the fair and that can't be um, that needs to be a priority in what we look to in designing our own divisional fair to get these students um, engaged and participating. Uh, along with that becomes a an edu uh, entertainment component. And I think that that is going to be part of the um, funding question that we look at moving forward. Um, certainly a lot of the educational things that we are talking about, the livestock and the educational programming that goes along with the fair are not necessarily revenue generating. So you do have to have partners and you do have to have an entertainment component, which is usually a carnival and certainly some special events that go along with the fair to help um, offset expenses. So the funding question is, is a complex one, one that we are working through. There's a lot of models out there for other fairs on how they have, I would say, shifted initial investment risk um, away from uh, their municipality to others, um, which could be a, a certainly a tactic to uh, explore in which we are. We've got a lot of resources available to us as well. We've got um, contacts with a lot of fair experts, uh, very renowned fair experts, as well as you know local people who have worked fairs at the fairgrounds for you know decades, whose expertise is going to be critical as we move forward in planning our own. So I just wanted to give you a little update as far as kind of what we're looking at and high level and that we will continue to refine proposals as we make contact with some entertainment and music executives and fair experts and um, to refine the details that are gonna go into our proposal moving forward to host a divisional fair. Thank you, Laura, and thank you for your thoughtful proposal. Um, do we have any questions from the board? This is Commissioner Bergeron. No, no, no questions per se. Just, just uh, I find I think it's really exciting. I, I I'm really I'm encouraged by the work that that Laura's done so far. And 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 one thing I, I want to highlight that I would love to see included in the mix is Nashville is such a such a diverse community, and I would love to see a way for um, the various uh, 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 communities that comprise Nashville to sort of have have involvement and be highlighted perhaps throughout throughout the div divisional fair and, and had, don't have a lot of uh, specific ideas behind that yet um, but but would just love to throw that out there that I would love to see all of the different um, communities maybe have a, sh a chance to contribute to have their own 
portions maybe have different nights that are sort of that night of the fair, something like that, um, I think would be a great way to embrace the diversity of this, of this really great city and, and community and, uh, and, and, and kind of make this fair very much Nashville. Great point, uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Commissioner Hammer? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, Chairwoman McNally. Um, I uh, thank you, Laura, for the, the work you've done on this. And I, I know I, I brought it up last meeting or two, uh, so I, I appreciate the, the follow through on that and think that the, the great direction and, and an exciting opportunity and, uh, and, and way we should be looking forward and, uh, and trying to fill out, uh, fill out that need, market need. Um, I think also additionally, if you wouldn't mind uh, touching base with our, our the, the administration, I don't know if it's uh, Mr. Phillips or, or whoever's handling our legislative affairs, but um, I do think that now that the state uh, fair has uh, at their own choosing decided to go to Wilson County, uh, that we shouldn't be uh, hamstrung from a, at least a legislatively and required to have a fair, whether we, we choose to or not, it should be you know at the board's discretion. Um, so maybe work with the state uh, legislature coming back into session to have have that discussion whether that we should have some cleanup language uh, regarding that uh, that that fair uh, fair statute. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, that concludes all of our business for the day. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion adjourn. This is Commissioner Berger on second that motion. Excellent. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Hammer? Aye. Commissioner Berger? Aye. Commissioner Weiner? Aye. And I, Commissioner McAnally, I'm an aye as well. Thank you so much, for everyone. That was a big, big meeting. We got a lot done. So thanks, and we'll see you next month. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.